you were explaining how none of those funds goes towards protecting um, the, the forests and the wildlife there. Do you think that's because of ignorance? Is it just going to take more and more awareness? Or do you think that there's that the that the profits again get in the way? The the profits on the old economic paradigm where you have to cut down the tree before it's worth anything, or you have to kill the elephant before it's worth anything, unless you can take a tourist to see it, and then it might have some value while it's alive. But all the other trees that aren't being visited by tourists or elephants that aren't being visited by tourists apparently have no value. That is, is obviously nonsense. Um, so where, where, where does money for conservation come from? We've all seen the charities that raise funds. I've been in the charity sector, as it were, for, um, as you pointed out at the beginning, more than 40 years. <laughs> um, and that all started with the gorilla behind me, um, because that's a portrait of Digit. And, and people who are aware of the, the Diane Fossey story, the gorillas in the mist story, you might remember a gorilla called Digit whose death changed everything. Uh, it certainly changed our life at Karasoki, the research center that Diane established in 1967, that I got to in 1976, and which is still going strong, but now not a ramshackle collection of huts in the forest, now just being opened a new campus funded by Ellen DeGeneres and, and her fund and, and Portia, who gave her a present of, let's build a, a university for guerrilla studies in, in Rwanda. So it's gone from a tent to a corrugated iron shack to now a campus, which is extraordinary. Um, that's that's uh, look up the Diane Fossey Guerrilla Fund International, DFGFI, uh, if you want more information on that, or the Ellen Fund, because there's a lot about that on, on there too. And that's a great example of organizations working together towards a common good. And it's, it's primarily through philanthropy. So when, when Digit was killed in the most horrible manner, um, he was killed because a, a trader in the nearby town had told the poachers, if you see some gorillas and you can kill one, I will buy a head and a pair of hands for $20. Because he knew that there were foreigners visiting Rwanda who would buy a gorilla skull or gorilla hands. People in Rwanda have no everyday use for gorilla skull or hands, and they, they don't in that part of Africa eat gorilla meat. So the gorillas in Rwanda and Eastern DRC and, and uh, Uganda have the good f fortune to have human neighbors that don't regard them as food. Fantastic. But there are some reasons why they might be killed. Um, and one of them was that foreigners would say, um, I'd like a gorilla skull to present to my local museum because I'm living here in Africa. And when I go back, I want people to know that I've been in Africa. So I will gain in social prestige by having, or I might just have it on my mantelpiece. What a curious, thing. wow, a gorilla skull. Anyone with an interest in anatomy, comparative anatomy, would think that's fascinating. Where did you get that? And say, oh, I picked it up, I was in Africa. But by picking it up, if you pay someone, then obviously he will think, uh, it's usually a he, uh, will think, well, that was $20. I could get another $20. And, and back in the 70s, $20 was a lot more money than it is today, especially for a rural African with no access to serious money. So Digit was one of our study animals, um, first st studied by Diane back in 67. She watched him mature from an infant to a young silverback. And just at the point in his life where he might have gone off and formed a group of his own, he was killed. The young silverbacks in that stage of life are, are often on the periphery of their family group. So they're like the protectors of the family. They're the, the disposable young males. If they get killed defending the family, that's a shame, but they're, they're, they're not the leader of the group. So the leader will often lead his females and kids away from danger and leave his sons to deal with the danger. And that's what happened here. Digit gave his life so that his family could survive. If he was a, a human, we'd give him a, a medal after his death and recognize that bravery. And it was my misfortune as a young researcher working with Diane to come across Digit's body. We were following, uh, the tracker and I were following a trap line because the poachers are normally setting snares for antelope. They're not interested in killing gorillas. 
They set the snares for the antelope. The, the snares are indiscriminate. So baby gorillas sometimes get caught in snares and will sometimes lose a hand or get an injury from the snares. So whenever we saw poacher sign, the rule was you follow that sign and destroy any traps so that they don't accidentally catch a gorilla. And we came around a bend in the trail, having cut a, a line of snares. And the May, the tracker, said to me, ah, well, you own gaggy. They've killed a gorilla. I couldn't think for a minute, even though I was using the word ngagi every day, I couldn't think what ngagi was. What have they killed? It's not a buffalo, it's not an antelope. And there was Digit's body, which was just awful. I didn't know it was Digit at first. Uh, when you see a body, you think, well, I look at the face to see who it is. Just an empty neck socket. They removed the head. Digit was called Digit because one of his fingers stuck out at a funny angle. He probably caught it in a trap as a child. And it yanked it out of joint, and so he was the gorilla with the funny finger. And Diane called him Digit because of that. So I picked up his arm to see if it had the funny finger and just a stump, because the hands have been hacked off too. We le later learned that this trader had offered $20 for a pair of hands and a, and a gorilla skull. So that was, that was how Digit died. And um, that was... At that stage in my life, the worst thing that ever happened to me. Uh, Digit would come and sit next to me. He, he, I considered him a friend because it's, it's a free forest. He can sit anywhere he wants. But he was um, a young male and <laughs> I was a young male. And I'm not saying we had a, a bond for that reason, but he didn't have playmates of his own age. And maybe that was why he chose to hang out with the human observers. Or maybe he was just curious. He would sometimes pick up my notebook and look at it. And, and there's a famous bit of film that Bob Campbell filmed of him doing that with Diane's notebook and she's lying next to him and the fact that he, he examined it and then put it back I had this sense of oh this is yours it's interesting but I don't want to have it back it was it was so lovely um, and those little snippets of guerrilla behavior that appeared in those National Geographic documentaries about Diane's work started this process of changing people's perception of gorillas from the, the horrific monsters which they'd been portrayed as by mainly sport hunters who think it's fun to go and kill an animal. And, and a, a gorilla's last breath is probably spent trying to fight off the attacker who's threatening his kids. Again, in, in human society, that's called heroism. Uh, and in gorilla society, we call them a monster because they go Rah! very loudly and, and terrify the hunter and the hunter shoots the gorilla. And that, that attitude to gorillas as being aggressive and, and dangerous and nasty was changing as a result of, of Diane's work and the fact that film of her and then film of, of TV presenters like David Attenborough came and I had the amazing privilege of, of being the person that introduced David Attenborough to the gorillas for that famous sequence in his Life on Earth series. Um, and those um, documentaries began this change in people's perceptions of gorillas. And now we see them as sort of friendly, gentle vegetarians, not entirely, sometimes they eat ants and termites too, but anyway, mostly eating leaves and stems and, and, and fruit and playing a role in the ecology of the forest and leading fascinating lives that when you get a chance to observe are, are just entrancing. It's, it's very, very um, interesting to watch a family of gorillas and see the little mannerisms that we think of as human. And then you think, oh, yeah, they do that too. <laughs> and I'm no doubt at all that once they are not afraid of humans and they're watching humans and they will sit and watch you, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. they probably think, yeah, I do that too. And I've had gorillas come and sort of look at my teeth because we trust each other completely. And, and that's what Diane gave to the world, that the ability to win the trust of wild gorillas who wouldn't then be wild in the sense of angry or, or dangerous, but would just accept you, maybe acknowledge your arrival and then ignore you and carry on feeding or playing with the kids or whatever they're doing. And you get to sit there and take notes. Oh, that's, that was me taking notes. Nowadays, of course, it's taking notes with a, yeah. <laughs> a tablet, which is analyzing your data before you even got back to camp. <laughs> so the science has changed, but the fascination has not changed. And now, of course, we're studying the children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of the gorillas that Diane first studied in the, in the 70s because they, they have a not too dissimilar life cycle to us, but the, they reach puberty around 10, 11, 
12, um, likely to have their first child around that age. Um, we tend to be a bit later these days, but uh, and, and then when they get into their late 30s and 40s, they, they're getting towards the end of their life in the wild. In captivity, some have lived into their 50s, and even 60 uh, apes have lived that long. So there are many similarities when you look at the, the trajectory of an average gorilla life from infancy in mother's arms, breastfeeding, being carried around the forest, protected, totally dependent on the mother. My, my, my most viewed uh, video, here's another bit of homework for your viewers, search on YouTube for gorilla mums. And, and YouTube has noticed that because something like 29 million people have watched it. It is, it is just two and a half minutes of gorilla behavior, but they're in a sanctuary with less vegetation than in the wild. So you can see what's going on. And usually in, in the forest, there's so many leaves, you can't see the, the details of the behavior. And I think what fascinates people about Gorilla Mums, the two and a half minute video, is that, that you see maternal care, you see a little bit of tool use where she uses a bit of grass to clean out the kid's ear, like a Q-tip, you know. Um, then, you, then you see her walk over to a friend and you see lots of non-verbal communication, affectionate touches. You come over here now and you say, all right, you come with me. And, and there's so much communication going on between these two gorilla mums who, who weren't expected to have babies because when gorillas are in a sanctuary, they're, they're put on contraceptives when they reach maturity because every baby is a place that could be needed for a rescued baby. So, so sanctuaries normally don't breed unless it's part of a reintroduction program and they're going back into some natural habitat and they can become a, a self-supporting group in, in forests that, that perhaps has been depleted of gorillas in the past and now you can put them back. That's the long-term goal of the sanctuaries. But um, that, that little uh, video is, is, is very, well, for anyone with an interest in, in, in the similarities between human behavior and non-human behavior, the, the, the other the non-human apes uh, will we'll find that interesting. I want people to, to understand these, these insights in, into the things that we have in common. I mean, obviously the differences are interesting too. That's why comparative anatomy is so interesting. Uh, then you look at elephants and a completely different anatomy. And so they've got to this, this the same sort of place where there's a complex society with multi-generations, you've got grandmothers and mothers and offspring, and sometimes great-grandchildren in a social group. So the kids are learning from, not just from their, their parents, but from their grandparents. That's, that's, that's quite unusual in the animal kingdom that there are grandparents playing a part in society. Um, and which, which groups do that? Well, cetaceans, the whales and dolphins in the oceans, uh, apes and elephants in, on, on land. And, and those three groups have all evolved big brains, long life, slow reproduction, and they all play a key role in the health of their particular ecosystem. So when we pluck an elephant or an orca from its family and put it in a, a yard or a tank and say, look, children, isn't it wonderful? I mean, it is wonderful. There's nothing quite like seeing an elephant up close, but the price that elephant pays pacing around a yard, even with enrichment, even with a field to walk around, compared to the life an elephant has in a, its natural society, never mind its natural habitat, its natural society, with all those links. And, and elephants communicate with each other using infrasonic communication, deep rumbles that are too low for the human ear to hear. So when you hear an elephant, it's going... a quiet rumbling contact call you're hearing the upper harmonics of a deep infrasonic call which is traveling through the air and through the land through the ground and elephants with those massive feet are feeling the seismic vibrations of someone perhaps a mile or two over there saying i'm over here and i've no doubt they recognize each other's voice so they're thinking yeah, yeah okay so and so is over there and so and so is over there and when they meet up at a waterhole or a salt lake or somewhere they're coming in from different directions. And people used to sit and think, how do they do that? They all turn up at the same time. It's like they've, they've got an appointment and they're actually just talking to each other, but we can't hear it. So that, that complexity of society in a habitat, which is, is, is many, many square miles that they learn during their long childhood 
the geography, the, the, the botany, which plants you can eat, how you prepare them. Well, this could, could apply whether I'm talking about apes or elephants. It's, it's, it's an interesting comparison to our life cycle where we spend years teaching our kids how to live in our society, how to succeed in our society. So do they. And so this idea that you can just hoik one out and, and put it on show somewhere, all that they've left behind, their family members are grieving the loss of that individual if they survive. If it's a baby ape, they won't survive because to catch a baby ape, you have to kill the parents. So I think we need to change our attitude to these animals and, and respect their cognitive powers and their social complexity and respect the role they play in the ecosystems that sustain us all. And what I hope we'll start to see happening as Damien Aspinall, the, the zoo owner in the UK who owns Howlett's in Portland, the Aspinall Foundation is a, about to send 13 African elephants, their family herd, back to Africa. Because Damien thinks, even though he's probably got the, the, the best kept elephants in captivity, they breed, they, they, they're much more natural in their behavior, but they're not part of a wider society. They're not part of an ecosystem. And so he wants to put them back. And I think increasingly zoos will come to this conclusion that these, particularly the large complex social mammals have no place in captivity. And we actually, we're short staffed. You know, the, 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 they're the gardens of the forest. The forest used to have what, 10 million elephants in Africa, it's estimated, and now there's fewer than half a million. And yet they're unemployed walking around a yard to show our kids what an elephant's like. And the kids have all got iPhones and, and other, <laughs> devices, uh, tablets and televisions to, to watch elephant documentaries. They've got a VR, VR headset. Of, of, do you know kids with one of these? You know, do they spend uh, yeah. their time do they spend their time playing shoot 'em up games or visiting distant lands and, and watching elephants? Because when you've got this on, it's like you're there. It's wonderful virtual reality as an educational tool. So another bit of homework for your viewers. Um, go to Vico Tourism, V for virtual, ecotourism.org. And you can take virtual visits to see elephants and gorillas and orangutans um, and get a sense of what it's like in that habitat. And then perhaps you'll think it more important that they're in the forest doing their job as a gardener, <laughs> mm -hmm. paid but, but benefiting us all, um, rather than, as we used to do, train them to jump through hoops and stand on things, which, which demonstrates their um, agility and their, their ability to learn tricks. So that, but, but what the cost to that animal, and the, the horrible life that it leads as an entertainer for humans is, is such that I think once you've, you've either virtually or, or actually met these animals in their natural habitat, you, you don't want to see them in a concrete tank or a yard or a, a wildlife park um, where they're out of their natural habitat. However, we're digressing. What I wanted to say <laughs> while, while giving people homework, um, there is a, a new TV channel called uh, Ecoflix, uh, which is a charity. So if you subscribe, your subscription is a, a tax deductible donation in the US and, and wherever you are in the world, it's, it's the, the money will go to protect animals and, and habitat. And it has some similarities to Mojo Streaming. I was really excited when I saw what, what yeah. you had said with Mojo Streaming because it is, it's, providing people with information so that they can take better decisions. And I think that can affect us all in our daily shopping, whatever we're buying. If, if the label says it's from a well-managed certified source and people care about what they care about, they, they care about, is this exploiting people in, in developing countries? So it needs to have a fair trade logo. Is it destroying rainforests? It needs to have a rainforest alliance friendly frog on it. Uh, is it. Is it certified if it's wood or paper, FSC logo? Um, but there isn't at the moment a sort of a wildlife friendly, an ecosystem friendly. There is if you're buying tuna, you, you know you can buy dolphin friendly tuna, which supposedly right. hasn't harmed dolphins. That's, that's good. But we, we need a better system so that the protection of these animals doesn't depend on charities. And Ecoflix is, I think, going to change things because um, David Castleman, the, the, the founder, has the means to help all sorts of projects around the world. Mm -hmm. But we somehow need to change it from helping a little project because of charitable giving to it's just part of our economy. And that's where the, the really exciting news is that there's a, an initiative called Rebalance Earth. 
And Rebalance Earth is actually the website, it's rebalance.earth. And that will explain to you how, how Ralph Sharmi, the chap I mentioned who's at the IMF, who calculated the value of whales, he also calculated the value of elephants. The value, not when they're killed in terms of their tusks or their meat or their skin, but the work they do every day. And it turns out that at the price of carbon in 2019, when he did the sums, a forest elephant in the Congo Basin, if allowed to live a full life of say 60 odd years, would be responsible for the additional sequestration of $1.75 million worth of carbon, which rather changes the, the conversation when you're saying, well, what's an elephant worth? I haven't got a lodge, so I can't bring a tourist to see it. Let's just kill it and sell the teeth. And you might get, if, if, if you're at the end of that ivory trade, you might get thousands of dollars for the teeth. If you're at the elephant end, you'd probably get a few hundred dollars, very little. But 1.75 million divided by 60 gives you an annual amount of about $30,000 per elephant per year in perpetuity. Because that elephant, if you protect it, will have babies and those will carry on. So what we're offering through Rebounds Earth is a system, and, and the third co-founder is Walid Al-Sakaf, who is a blockchain specialist, using the trusted, transparent, traceable system of blockchain, someone or, or some corporation, be it a you know, family, an individual, or, or a huge business that wants to offset its unavoidable greenhouse gas emissions, can put the money into the um, Rebounds Earth system, and a community that lives near those elephants will be paid for monitoring them and confirming that they're alive and well. So think of the elephants not only as gardeners of the forest, but it's like they're clocking on and clocking off. But they don't clock off. They just work day and night. They have a, they have a snooze every so often. But we don't know how many days they've been working. But if someone was monitoring each individual elephant, we think of them as our client elephants, then they could be paid for the work that they do. And I remember I mentioned that Ralph did his calculations in um, 2019. Since then, it's now 2022, the price of carbon has gone up by three. So we're not talking about 1.75 million per elephant, 30,000 a year. We're talking about upwards of 5 million per elephant, nearly 100,000 a year per elephant, if, if that um, calculation is accurate. And that's based on, on uh, a study by an Italian biologist called Fabio Bazzaghi. And Fabio compared two bits of the Congo Basin forest, one with a population of elephants, one where they've been killed decades ago. And he found that the above ground biomass, trees, branches, etc., where there were elephants was about 7% more than where there weren't elephants. Now you start to calculate that for the area of forest in the Congo Basin, that's you know, gigatons of carbon, it's huge quantities that can be attributed to the presence of elephants. So we're saying to the communities, so we're in the process of setting up pilot projects to sort of prove the concept. Say to the communities, look, you protect these elephants, get to know them. And when you recognize our client, um, let's say it's, it's Nelly, the elephant, good name. And Nelly has a particular ear pattern. No other elephant has a hole in her ear like that. So you see Nelly and we will pay you for all the days that Nelly has worked in the forest since the last time Nelly was seen, if it's eighty dollars a day, which is what the one point seven five million translates into, um, that, that's what money is on the table. It's not all going to come to the person who monitors them. He'd be paid a, a, a have a job monitoring the elephants. The community would be able to build a fence to keep the elephants out of their crops. That's their, often the biggest bugbear about rural communities. They don't mind elephants except when they come into their crops and, and damage them. And who's got the money for an electric fence? Well, with Rebalance Earth, there would be money. And, and the biggest issue is that the kids have to travel miles to a school and they might get squashed by an elephant on the way. That's, that happens and it's awful. What a tragedy for a family to lose a child on the way to school because it meets an elephant and doesn't know what to do. So we build, um, make safe passageways for, for the kids or, or build a school in your own village so they don't have to walk for miles because there'd be money on the table. So it, it really would help to bring uh, poverty-stricken communities up to a, a, a more acceptable level. It's not gonna end poverty completely, but it's certainly gonna help a lot. 
and not for a short time, not, not because there's a three year project and we've raised the money through a charity and, and we'll, we'll spend that money. And then after three years, people go home and, and 10 years later, it's like nothing happened. And I've seen that happen so often in, in Africa. This is building a system that in perpetuity would mean that as long as the, there are identified client elephants and we hope to expand to gorillas and orangutans and all the other species that matter, well, I mean, all species matter, but the ones that it's, it's easy to demonstrate a financial difference to their presence in the ecosystem services provided by that habitat. So then Ralph's idea of a new economic paradigm that values living nature comes into being. And when you buy that bottle of wine, the company that makes the wine or, or the loaf of bread or the laptop, whatever you're buying, the company that makes it has offset by buying biodiversity credits through Rebalance Earth, which includes the carbon component, but also helping protect the biodiversity in the forest and also lifting people out of poverty and also investing in, in women so that they can have small businesses and bring up their kids and lots of very positive things that can happen if you have this flow of finance to rural communities. And that's gonna really help them and it'll help the government of the country because suddenly the, the economic activity in that area will, will be boosted. So more taxes for the government, they can start to pay for the schools out of, out of that economic activity. It doesn't have to be elephant money. But at the moment, when you, when you go around Africa, you see schools being built or clinics being built. And there's a big sign saying this is a gift from the people of the United States or USAID or from the European Union or some donor agency. And we want signs saying this is your elephants that are paying for this new school, clinic, community centre. And you protect your elephants and they'll look after you into the future, not for two years or five years, but in perpetuity. I mean, that's, that's sort of an amazing vision. And we just have to sort of get the pilot project off the ground and demonstrate that it can work. And then we can start to expand out. You know, there, there are 50 countries with elephants, actually 51 now, because Sudan split the Sudan and the South Sudan. So there's, there's 38 in Africa and 13 in Southeast Asia. Those are just the elephant range states. Mm. And we don't know yet the exact um, difference in elephants in Asia or in, in the deserts of Namibia or in, in the, the savannas of, of Kenya or Tanzania. We haven't yet got the data to say how they affect it, but the indications are that it's the soil carbon they really help. So elephants in a savanna habitat increase the amount of soil carbon and other nutrients so the soils are healthier. And the, the, again, the ecosystem services provided by the savanna is more effective. It enhances the job it does that we all benefit from, but, but none of us are particularly aware of or pay for. And we want to try and bring that into the global economy so that, uh, yeah, there will probably still be charities trying to help a project here and a project there, but it won't depend on that. It will actually be a, a better organized global economic system. And then there'd actually be some... Um, finance on the table so that whatever the, the UN agrees in their post-2020 global biodiversity framework, um, th you know, the communities don't feel that this is something that's taking away from their development. It's actually enhancing their development because we value the ecosystems that they are the guardians of. So it's, it's, a, it's a, an interesting concept and it all kind of started with, with Digit and, and the elephants that I studied. And again, I faced individual elephants that I'd known killed for their front teeth, faces sawn off because somebody on the other side of the world wants an ivory knickknack. You think, oh, come on. That, that is not the best fate for, for an elephant to end up on somebody's mantelpiece. Um, so we're going to change people's understanding of an attitude to um, these species. And hopefully with that growing understanding, there will be more respect for them. And um, it, will, uh, it will transform um, well, hopefully it won't transform, it will, it will perpetuate life on Earth. The, the, the rich biodiversity that we, we've grown up with can be restored somewhat. We've depleted it so much during my adult life. This year I celebrate the 50th anniversary of becoming an adult. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, you'd think I'd have done better by now. <laughs> but, uh, oh, well, give, give me a few more years. And we'll, <laughs> together, I can't do it on my own, but, but together we can make this difference. And hopefully uh, people who are coming of age now, reach, reaching 18, by the time they're 68, they'll, they'll have a much better chance of a, of a sustainable future.
And that's, you know, right now in, in Stockholm, the UN's having its 50 years on from the Stockholm conference that launched a lot of these conventions. And later in the year, China will be hosting the CBD. It, it's all moving in that direction, but we really, we as, as members of the public, as, as voters and as shoppers, uh, we have such power, our political power and our, our the power of our purse or pocket to influence the decisions that companies make. And now you can get apps that, that will tell you if, if a, a company is using unsustainable products and you can tell the company director that you're not going to buy it because you, you don't like the way they're sourcing their raw materials. And how many messages like that does a, a company director have to get before he thinks we'd better do something about this? So I think, I think we're, th these communication devices have huge power. and We haven't yet learned how to use them to, to benefit the, the planet, but I think that will come very soon that we, we in our daily decisions can influence the boardrooms and the, the political gatherings to take better decisions so that we do less destruction and, and more, um, more wildlife friendly living. Yeah, I can tell you're really excited about, about the Rebalance Earth program. Um, and, and the pilot is just getting off the ground, you said? So we're going to have to check yeah. back with you to see uh, how that's we, going. We, yeah, yeah well, well, you can sign up. There's a, there's a thing to get in, keep informed on rebounds.earth. Um, and, and on Ecoflix, we'll be carrying news of all sorts of activities. Ecoflix has got lots of partner NGOs. And whatever they're doing, when there's a film about it or, or a, a clip from the camera trap, um, I don't know about you, I love watching camera trap videos because the animals don't know they're being filmed. So yeah. they're just completely at ease. Or they're looking, what is that? That wasn't there last time. And so you get this really clear look <laughs> at the animals. And, and think about that. If that's one of our client animals, they've just identified themselves. So, okay, um, the person who monitors the camera trap will say, yes, we, we've seen um, these, these known client animals and we can confirm that they're alive and well because here's a picture of them. So when you buy your, your product from the company that is, offsetting its unavoidable greenhouse gas emissions this way, you go to their website and there's the elephant you help to protect or the, the gorilla or the chimpanzee or the orangutan who's peering at a camera trap that your money helped to pay for and, and you, you know that it's alive and well in the forest. And that really connects you. It's not just looking at a map of global weather patterns. It's, oh, actually, no, I, I, I know that individual and, and I'm helping to support his or her conservation by buying products that have been a part of this um, this ecosystem service payment. So yeah, it's it's a lot of gobbledygook payment for ecosystem services and, and biodiversity frameworks. But the, the goal is to is to have animals do what they evolved to do, mm -hmm. or if you prefer, were created to do. I'm not going to get into that discussion. But whether it was God who designed it, or whether it evolved, or whether God designed the system of evolution. I don't know why no one suggests that as a good compromise. Anyway, however they got there, they, they have a job to do. And if we actually were to pay for that work and put the money in, in, in a way that enhances their survival, then we would have a much healthier world, I think. 